Tonight, your wallet is not welcome here. It's bring your Google to work day, and Lenovo gets hit by the Lizard Squad. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 282 for Wednesday, February 25th, 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you can grow and protect your wealth. Best of all, it's free. And for a limited time, Twit viewers could qualify for up to $10,000 on any new account. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash TN2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the news. The mobile payment arena is getting crowded these days with this week's news that Google has made a deal with three wireless companies, and they've also bought the intellectual property of mobile payment provider SoftCard. This is obviously an effort to restart Google Wallet in hopes that the company can catch up with Apple Pay. And on the other side of the arena is Samsung, who recently purchased mobile payment provider Loop Pay, a technology that works with current credit card readers, unlike Apple Pay or SoftCard. Joining us to discuss the ever-changing landscape of mobile payment systems is Dan Rowinski of ARC, a website that covers all the latest news in apps. Welcome, Dan. Hi, Megan. So do you think Samsung's going to release Samsung Pay next week at Mobile World Congress? So everything that I've been told so far, yes. Um, I even talked to uh, the CEO of Loop Pay yesterday, and he his basically said, you know, Samsung will have their first salvo, first initial thoughts on on payments on Sunday, along with the announcements of the Galaxy S6. So definitely, I believe that uh, that Samsung is ready to jump into this whole hog. So so what will it look like? Well, what will Samsung Pay be like? Do you have any idea? So uh, Loop Pay and Samsung have actually been working together for a year or more. So this is plenty of time to have had actually baked the Loop Pay, uh, their, their technology uh, called Magnetic Secure tr Transmission, um, into phones. Um, so it's probably going to look a lot like, you know, a, your, your typical mobile wallet. Uh, we've seen this from Google Wallet and Apple Pay and Square, so on and so forth. Um, what's going to be different is that so... Uh, you're, you're showing it right now. The, the difference between what Samsung's going to do and what Apple Pay and Google Wallet does is that uh, you don't need the near field communications chip. And if you go to a merchant that doesn't have NFC, you can't use your Apple Pay, right? So what Loop Pay does is actually I have the the dongle right here. Uh, you just put it next to the magnetic card reader like you would with your with your uh, debit card or credit card, and it works. It takes the same information and it uses the the Magstripe technology as opposed to having the whole tap and pay. Um, so instead of the whole tap on the NFC reader with your phone, you just put it right next to uh, to basically any card reader that's already available. Loop Pay says they are capable with 90% of POS systems already in existence. So, so what you were holding there, it won't be, it will actually be baked in what you're saying. It won't be a separate dongle. No. So this, what Loop Pay has been doing, uh, they've been around since 2012. They've been making dongles and key fobs. And uh, this is basically, you can see it. It's a uh, sort of just this reader. They've been making uh, cell phone cases with this sort of baked in. Um, but inside of here, there's this basically a, a ring of, uh, that's about this big. Um, that it essentially serves as a component. So that can go straight into a phone with the secure element, say here, this is a Galaxy uh, uh, Edge 4. Um, and so you put these two together and it should work. Uh, and Lupe has been really, this sort of been the, the holy grail for them was to get out of the accessory business and into the phone. And we didn't expect Samsung to buy them. Uh, but... Samsung made an investment in them in July last year, which uh, wasn't reported at the time. And then around December-ish, they said, hey, well, we might as well just buy you. And then that's when the, the deals went down. Right. So now you say that uh, this technology will also help businesses accept mobile payments. Are they talking about um, upgrading the credit card systems with Samsung Pay on, on the business end also? So that's the thing with Lupe is that you don't actually have to 
upgrade the POS system um, at at the merchant. Right. So a lot you see a lot of you know accepts Apple Pay, accepts Google mm-hmm. Wallet. These are v- NFC based terminals, but that's usually at a higher end retailer. You know, I live across from a Walgreens and a Whole Foods, and it should be fine in, to use Apple Pay there. But if I'm going to the convenience store down the street, they don't. Yeah. Um, but to make a make a payment there, all I have to do is hold it next to the to the magistrate reader like I would my debit card. Right. Uh, so that's kind of like the value of Loop Pay and the integration with Samsung is to not actually have to upgrade every point of sale system in the world to be able to accept it. Right. So Ars Technica reported today that a source says Google will announce a new payment API called Android Pay. It, they're supposedly going to uh, announce this at Google I.O. in May. Do you have any information about that? I don't. Uh, when you sent that to me, that was the first I saw it. But it makes sense from Google's perspective. They uh, they want to get into both the developer stack and the and on the phone. The soft card acquisition was actually fairly big for them this week because basically the whole tap to pay, the NFC secure element, was being blocked by Ver- Verizon, T-Mobile, and AT and T. Mm-hmm. Now that they've sort of over- overcome that, and the carriers have basically waved the white flag and said, okay. You know, we failed horribly at this mobile payments thing. Um, Android Android Pay, from a developer perspective, all the way up the app stack, uh, will make sense, and will also sort of revamp the brand. Google Wallet's been around since 2011. A lot of people know about it, haven't really used it, so it should be interesting. And Google loves to do the we have two of everything. Type of thing they have YouTube right. music and they have Google Play music, um, so on and so forth. Right. So now, for the average person, um, what will the experience? How will the experience be different? I mean, is that is this something that if someone is on the fence of you know wanting to switch from iOS to Android, uh, is the is what they're going to experience with Samsung Pay or Google Wallet going to be a really different experience? Um, that's really hard to tell. I mean. I, I view a lot of these, the payments and the health and all these things that Apple and Google are doing as really like platform lock-in. Um, so if you have all your payment data on Android, you have all your health data on Android, you're going to stay on Android. Same with iOS. I don't see it as a way to gather information, but more to just keep people locked into Android and iOS. So I, I think at this point, the the systems are going to be so sort of similar from a function parity-wise that... If, if you're already a fan of one, you're probably going to stay there. All right. Now, you uh, also talk about how Samsung doesn't just make phones. They make all kinds of devices, smart TVs. And and so uh, what what does that mean? Will there be payment systems in all these other t- devices? Um, so you had mentioned TVs, and I don't I, – not, the TVs probably wouldn't be a part of it. There would be more stuff like this is uh, their, their uh, latest Wearable. smartwatch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, and Apple Pay is going to do this too, I believe. Be able to just pay with your uh, smartwatch. Right. But We're not going to be carrying our TVs around to pay with them at Walgreens. I really hope not. <laughs> um, but, uh, and also, I mean, Samsung is the supplier to, you know, everything and everywhere. So we'll see, you know, uh, cases, dongles, uh, key fobs, uh, anything that can be sort of carried around. Um, but... It's more than that. Samsung wants to, at least according to uh, Will Graylin, the CEO of Lupe, who I talked to, like eventually we might see this Lupe technology in an iPhone. I mean, app, uh, Samsung has supplied chips for the iPhone. They've supplied technology to the iPhone, even through the battles between Apple and Samsung. Um, but as a component manufacturer, it wouldn't be a surprise to see Samsung push this out into the ecosystem too. HTC, Motorola, Apple, uh, if they're willing to deal with Samsung on a component level and maybe not so much that service level where you get into like loyalty cards and and, uh, gift cards and so on and so forth. Um, From a component perspective, I I will be surprised if Samsung doesn't try to at least push that out. Yeah, it will be interesting. I mean, you know, Samsung was the first to have the bigger screen and Apple followed that. So so maybe, I mean, if it works... Maybe we'll see them in the future. So let's talk a little bit about Mobile World Congress. It's in Barcelona next week, and you will be there. Uh, and it seems like it's Galaxy S6's show. Are you excited about this new phone? 
Um, well, let's see. I th- I've been to every Galaxy device announcement since the S2, I think. You're um, jaded. So I, I am a little bit. Uh, it was actually after, I, I believe it was the S4, the Broadway show, that you're just like, okay, um, it's a new phone. Uh, <laughs> it's an S. It's another number. Bleh. But so here's the surprising thing is that um, ever since that moment, and they got so much backlash from that moment, um, Samsung's actually been a calmer company. I was at their developer conference in uh, Moscone in November, and uh, they didn't try to push everything down everybody's throat. There wasn't like this whole theatric production. It was actually a very almost uh, calm developer conference. And if you've ever been to IO or WWDC, these things aren't calm. Um, and uh, maybe it's just a Samsung's taken a step back and reassessed the the message it, it is sending out. So they'll still probably have the 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 big arena and the little opera um, concerto people playing in the corner. But I don't expect it to be too over the top and really get down to like here's what the new phone is and here's how we've iterated on what we've been doing. I do expect uh, increased value on industrial design to catch up with HTC and Apple because that's really where Samsung's been lacking. Uh, The curved displays, um, Samsung Pay will have its time on stage. Uh, So I would expect a a sleek, attractive phone and then the marketing machine that is Samsung to, to get up on that. So the the images that were leaked by Sam Mobile today that uh, that had the all metal frame it was really slim. Do you think that's the phone? Yeah, I think that's one of the phones. The thing about Samsung is that the, I bet they maybe not at Mobile World Congress, but they will release the high end version and they say this is the flagship, and they'll they'll sort of go downstream a little bit with like the S five had you know the S five variants and we'll eventually see a lot of variants that might be cheaper design HTC does this too um, but this you know it should be as sleek and beautiful as Samsung can make it and if not everybody's going to going to spear them for it right and do you believe that price point of the of over a thousand dollars well uh, I was reading something earlier price points really hard to tell so like in Europe uh, a pr- the price of a phone is different from what we're going to see in the US in the US I'm almost certain we'll see that 199 on tier contract or the payment plan that you get through the carrier right. uh, when you're talking about what the phone actually costs um, 128 gigabyte that's what they're saying is the thousand the thousand dollar phone that's it's like a laptop from three years ago. Like that cost a thousand dollars. So it doesn't seem outside of the realm of possibility, but that's really expensive, especially as smartphone prices keep on coming down. Right. I mean, sometimes when they put you on those payment plans, it does feel like it might be a thousand dollars. You're paying it off for years. And um, yeah. All right. So let's move on. Uh, today, Google announced Android for Work. They've announced this before, but uh, they're announcing it again. That's a whole new suite of new apps to help businesses integrate the Android platform into the workplace. There's Android for Work app. There's a Google for Google Play Work for Work app. And what what are, what are your thoughts on Google's effort in this area? So it's really um, combining a lot of things that have just been hanging out in the open for Google, uh, the Google Apps Engine, uh, various enterprise stuff that they've been doing, and giving it you know one pretty package. Um, it's interesting to see them do this, and considering that there have been there's a co- whole cottage industry of enterprise mobility that has basically sat on top of Android for a long time. And in, in, in the announcement, you see that they partnered with a lot of those companies. Um, but it's necessary. I, I use my phone for work all the time. There's some things I can't do on it. Um, and I go to my IT guy and I say, why can I do this? And I say, well, it's not supported. Um, we'll let you know when it is. And this makes it a lot easier for enterprises and, and even companies um, for the size of, size of applause where the, who owns Arc to easily set up these capabilities, uh, at least in theory. Um, one thing I think is interesting to note is, so Apple has a mobility partnership with IBM for enterprise stuff. You don't notice um, IBM in the partners for Google at work, but you do see a company called Moss 360, M-A-A-S 360, which is a product from a company called Fiberlink, which IBM actually bought. So. There is an IBM aspect into Google for work or Android for work 
that is not sort of on the surface. They're not shouting it, but mm -hmm. uh, IBM is definitely in there. And if you know how companies buy enterprise mobility, um, they go to IBM and say, what can you sell us? How can you, how can you help us um, secure and manage our, our workforce and their smartphones? And this is, you know, it might seem a little archaic now, but that's how business works. Right. Yeah. So for us, it just, we just see the, the front end pretty side, but there's a lot of corporate stuff going on underneath that. So, so you write for a website called ARC. Um, it's part of Applause. Uh, tell us a little bit about what ARC does, what kind of content so, you write. So ARC um, is the Application Resource Center. Uh, we are owned and operated by uh, Applause, which is an app quality company here in Massachusetts. And ARC is essentially, um, I like to think of it as, you know, the, the thinking person's publication. It's got sort of a 2015 design and functionality. Um, I've taken a lot of inspiration from people like Ezra Klein and um, say like Medium. You can see the right. design. Yeah, I was going to ask about, you do seem inspired by Medium. There's a lot of long form content. Your, your, your mobile payment is like a series. It's a lot. It's a lot of, it's not just this. It's not Twitter. <laughs> no, so um, I learned, I, I've taken a lot of different influences to put it into ARC. Uh, and one of those was um, my editor-in-chief at Read Write when I was there, uh, Owen Thomas, we talked about we want to map the programmable world. And this is really an extension of that, um, of that philosophy we had at Read Write. So like this, uh, the payment series, I think we call it the crossroads of e-commerce, is like our our attempt at ARC to map what is happening in commerce, not just payments, but like everything a merchant or an enterprise is going to need to know to survive in this new, very fast-moving digital world uh, where beacons are coming up, mobile payments are coming up, all this data that they're trying to deal with multi-channel uh, selling. We have a lot of uh, different series. We have a travel series. We have a series on iOS and Android. Um, uh, discoverability, app discoverability is a big issue for, for developers right now. So this is the idea is to provide really thoughtful content to serve the reader uh, who's going to be an app developer or a company or maybe just an individual recruiter or somebody who's just curious about how all this crazy technology stuff works uh, and really help educate them to be able to use their, use their devices better, make better decisions, make better business decisions. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, I know you'll be in Barcelona next week and hopefully if we have the right connection and the right time zone, we will talk to you again about uh, the announcements that happen. At mobile Thank World you, Congress. Megan. Thanks. That was Dan Rowinski from ARC. Coming up, patent trolls take advantage of Apple's giant pile of money. And will your child spend their allowance on Blue's Clues? But first, right now is the time to start investing smarter. Personal Capital has an easy way for you to do it. Plus a very special offer for Twit viewers and listeners. For a limited time, when you open a new personal capital account, they'll give you $100 for every $100,000 you deposit up to $10,000. You get cash in your account and personalized investment advice from Personal Capital's registered investment advisors. Schedule your free one-on-one -on -one investment consultation today. I do not know how long this offer will be available. I don't. With their award-winning financial app, you can monitor your income, spending, and the performance of your investments in real time on a single, easy-to-read screen. Find and eliminate high mutual fund and 401k fees and other hidden brokerage fees that may be costing you years off your retirement. And best of all, it's free. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better financial decisions and manage your portfolio like a pro. So why wait? Now is the time to invest smarter and open a personal capital account. Make taking control of your financial future the first thing on your to-do list today. Go to Personal Capital now and set up a free account. And for a limited time, if you qualify, Personal Capital will give you $100 for every $100,000 you deposit up to $10,000. That's personalcapital.com slash TN2. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. All week, we've been talking about troubled PC maker Lenovo. They installed spyware called Superfish on many of their low-end laptops, and they really had no idea that people would be upset about this, or they hoped no one would notice. Well, today, Lenovo.com was hacked by a group claiming to be the Lizard Squad. This afternoon, the site was updated to show a slideshow of photographs of a tween or teen with the soundtrack of Breaking Free from High School Music, musical. 
it, the site is back up now. Radio Shack's biggest shareholder, hedge fund, Standard General, has offered to buy 1,700 of Radio Shack stores. The name Radio Shack will be sold separately, just like batteries. The opening bid is $20 million. Score one for the patent trolls. Today, Apple was ordered to pay five, $532 million in damage to a company called Smart Flash for allegedly violating its patents. Smart Flash is a licensing firm, also known as a patent troll, which means that it's a company that a spokesperson from Apple says makes no products, has no employees, creates no jobs, has no U.S. presence, and is exploiting our patent system to seek royalties for technology Apple invented. The patents that Smart Flash owns were parts of the technology behind digital rights management, data storage, and payment systems. This is another example of how the patent system is basically broken. Apple will appeal the decision. And finally, toddler cord cutters take note. The network famous for the show You Can't Do That on Television will no longer be doing that on television. Nickelodeon just announced that they'd be reviving kids' network Noggin, but only on Apple devices. As of March 5th, the network will be available as an ad-free subscription on iOS for only $5.99 a month, and it will feature content that's not available on Nickelodeon's cable channel. This comes on the heels of some pretty horrible ratings for Nickelodeon, because have you heard? Kids today, they don't watch TV. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Do you have tips or suggestions for the show? You can write directly to me at Megan, M-E-G-A-N, at twit.tv. I want to hear from you. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. That's the number two. You can write to everyone who works on the show at TN2 at twit.tv. And you can watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. And if you're in the Bay Area, stop by and watch the show live. Do you like the show? Do you hate it? Either way, we want to hear from you. Leave a review where everyone, wherever anyone will let you leave a review. I'll be gone for the rest of the week, dressing up like a Union soldier in the Civil War for a fourth grade field trip. But Mike Elgin will be hosting TN2 tomorrow and all about Android's Jason Howell will host on Friday. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.